Um, I guess I'll go ahead and start talking. So, so the organizers asked me to kick things off here. And uh, obviously, I'm not going to give a broad review talk. That's not necessary for this audience. I'm going to try to uh, avoid repeating things that I've said a number of times over the last year and try to start by, I try to focus on giving some broader perspective in many ways. And um, the first thing I want to say is, is to comment on the session title for today. So the session title today was called The Case for Firewalls. And I want to be clear that from my own point of view, there really isn't such a thing as a case for firewalls. That is to say, the idea. I want to make very clear that you know, the firewall is not a well-developed idea. It's not a theory. There's no definite you know, mechanics involved. Rather, it, there is, we think, a problem, uh, and a rather serious problem. And uh, the uh, idea of the firewall is, if you like, a um, talking point and an expression of our own uh, uh, um, desperation uh, in looking for a good solution. So let's see. Ah, good. This has now come up, and I can show you some slides. So this is the title of my talk, The Problem. Okay. And to be clear, um, in this talk, to confine the discussion for a moment, I'm going to talk about the problem if you assume that black holes evolve unitarily. I'll try to save discussion of information loss scenarios for a different uh, session when there'll be plenty of time to discuss them later. Then, as I say, uh, it's our understanding that the problem is quite serious, and I want to argue for that. Uh, it appears to require what we might call large modifications of effective field theory, at least at the horizon of the black hole, although not necessarily outside the horizon. And it is our opinion, where our means the AMPS sort of group anyway, that uh, proposed resolutions of this are not sufficient to remove the problem. Obviously, that's something we're going to be debating and discussing over the next week or two. Uh, it is not my purpose today in this talk to, well, there are too many proposed resolutions for me to attempt to address them all in this talk. We have lots of time throughout the next two weeks to do that. Instead, I'm going to concentrate on stating the problem as I understand it. On the other hand, since this term firewall comes up, um, I want to mention, again, what I mean by, or we mean by, what you might call the firewall hypothesis. This is intentionally in smaller print than the problem, OK? Um, what we mean is just that it looks like there needs to be large modifications of effective field theory to make something work out. We see no particular reason for those modifications to be kind to standard model type observers falling into the black hole. We therefore would, would propose that, perhaps as a, at least a talking point, that something dramatic has to happen at the afflicted horizons. Um, but since we don't have, we're not forced to change physics outside, it seems natural to kind of to try to keep the physics outside from changing, to propose that the effect outside is minimal. Um, if we don't do that, we run into potential conflict both with ADS CFT on the theoretical side and also with possibly observations present like the Event Horizon Telescope or near future like LIGO on the experimental side. All right. So sometimes to be concrete, to have a picture in mind, even though it's an overly simplified and incomplete model, it can be interesting to discuss the simple picture of some intense burst at radiation, say at the Planck scale, or maybe some lower scale. We don't have control over what, what's going on exactly, uh, localized around the would-be horizon. And of course, if it's really a Planck scale kind of phenomenon, you have to worry about back reaction. What would that mean? And you know, who knows? OK. Anyway, bottom line is going to be uh, we need some kind of theory of what's going on. And I'm sure Joe will say a lot more about this later. This is my introduction. Um, the major part of the talk is supposed to be to state what the problem is from our current perspective. And although there's been a lot of discussion over the last year about correlations and entanglement and so forth, I want to emphasize that that's something that we've always seen as a diagnostic tool and not necessarily the root of the problem. Um, I think, well, certainly I would strongly endorse, and I think my collaborators would endorse, that the root of the problem is trying to reconcile a supposed finite density of states for the black hole with effective field theory. Okay? And the summary of the situation seems to be that effective field theory seems to fail badly for typical states of the black hole. Okay. 
Um, interestingly enough, this is actually the first kind of pro-firewall argument that Joe and I discussed in I don't know, May or so of last year in a, uh, when we were waiting for some seminar to start in the Bits and Brains program. Um, but I'm going to give a particular version of the argument that appeared in a recent paper with Joe, although it has all kinds of historical antecedents. And I wanted to mention that I, Raphael may be saying more about similar things this afternoon. And there's also a paper by Avery, Chaudhuri, and Poom, which emphasizes the importance of thinking about typical states. In order to make this argument as precise as possible, because I know this audience is one that likes to ask about exceptions and technicalities and you know, possible holes in the argument, um, I'm going to use the context of ADS CFT. But I certainly believe that the argument is more broad, that whenever there's a finite density of states, there's an issue. Um, I also want to mention that although, although I'm going to use ADS CFT, I'm not going to assume that the CFT encodes necessarily all bulk physics. There's, it's a weaker use of ADS CFT than that. All right. So without further ado, um, Oh, here is the part of ADS CFT that I want to use. So ADS CFT is supposed to be a, a correspondence between string theory, quantum gravity in asymptotically anti de Sitter spaces, and some dual conformal field theory. And of course, here I really mean gauge gravity duality. The conformal structure is not going to be relevant. Um, an important part of the correspondence is that the ground states map to each other, that the ADS, uh, the vacuum state for the ADS theory maps to the vacuum state for the dual theory. But if I ha this is a, a normal conformal field theory, or normal field theory, so I can do the normal kinds of things to it to manipulate uh, the vacuum state if I happen to start with the vacuum. So suppose that I begin with the vacuum in this CFT. If I work hard enough, by coupling sources to the conformal field theory, I can manipulate that state and turn it into other states. And we normally believe that in a field theory, if you act with generic sources and you know, act in a, a fine-tuned way, that you can evolve the vacuum to essentially any state you like. So I'm going to assume that that's the case here. So with enough care, and perhaps acting over you know, long amounts of time, we can make any conformal field theory state we like. Um, on the bulk side, that's dual to this oper of adding sources to the CFT is, of course, dual to change in the anti de Sitter boundary conditions, as indicated by the blue dots on the boundary, okay, to make them time dependent, to throw energy in, take energy out of the, of the bulk as we like with some manipulation. So if you read this backwards, this says that um, any bulk state, and in particular, any bulk black hole, which can be created by using this notion of sources to throw in or perhaps take out radiation at the boundary um, must be dual to some pure state in the CFT. Because acting with sources acts, uh, enacts a unitary transformation, so it takes pure states to pure states. Of course you may. Oh, wait, wait, so hold on. You can't, wait to you can't ask a question unless you have a microphone. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Perturbations you allow on the right-hand side, namely in terms of operators that act in the CFT, yes. it's not clear to me that any such perturbation can be represented on the left-hand side as something you do on the boundary. Let me be clear. Um, when I say source here, I'm actually thinking very specifically about sources that couple to local operators in the CFT of small enough dimension that the resulting deformed theory is still UV complete. OK, that's okay? fine. All right. All right. Okay. And, I, and I claim that it is natural to believe that that set of sources is still sufficient to generate all states in the CFT as long as you act over long enough intervals of time and perhaps choose your sources carefully. Okay, but that's less clear than the original statement you made because you selected some special class of operators there to do this. This is matter, this, okay. This is the statement I wish to make. I want sources that I can actually exponentiate and put, I mean, consider as finite deformations of the CFT action. OK, all right. Mm -hmm. so, so in some circumstances, for example, when, with non-trivial topology, the CFT isn't determined by its local operators. There are, there are things like Wilson loops and so on that are not determined that way. Yes. Um, so it's also not clear to me that this gets everything. Well, so, so there 
questions about to what extent we have a fine-grained ADS-CFT correspondence where you get all the states on the bulk side. And so can you say what you're assuming about the answer to those questions? Well, let's see. All I've assumed is that whenever I turn on a source of the kind I just specified in the CFT, there is a corresponding change in the ADS boundary conditions. And then I've said that any bulk state that I can make that way is dual to a pure state in the CFT. Let me just speak in, in favor of Don's proposal, which is that really, given the picture of black holes in ADS-CFT as thermal ensembles, all you're really claiming is that by acting with relevant operators, you can create a sort of random state of a given finite energy. Yeah. That's all you're saying. That's all I'm saying. And are, are you going to be clear when you make a semi-classical or classical approximation in the bulk? I mean, so, I mean, I'm used I'll to try. thinking. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I will try. We will try. Okay. So at the moment, everything is still quantum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. So now a piece of terminology. Um, this is the convenient way to throw in things from the boundary. And so we would like to claim that in this context, a useful term for the set of states that you can make by uh, applying these CFT sources is the set of states that are made by collapse. It's just not rapid collapse. It could be a very, very slow. I'm happy if it takes even exponentially long amounts of time to, quote, collapse this. And the collapse is not free. It has to be played with and tuned as it goes along. But I will simply use this as a word to describe the set of bulk states that can be made in this way. Thank you for not objecting. <laughs> OK. So a return to the problem. The problem, as I say, is the finite density of states. Um, and just to highlight this, let's consider a particular ensemble. So let's consider what you would think of as a microcanonical ensemble of these collapsed states. So let rho be the ensemble of states made by this collapse process whose energies lie in some definite range. Um, this is just sort of by construction, the set of bulk states that are dual to the microcanonical ensemble in the CFT. Okay? Uh, a microcanonical ensemble, of course, is an ensemble where every state has weight 1 or 0. So it defines, in particular, a subspace of the Hilbert space, which I'll call H sub E, just to have some notation. Um, to be definite, I'm thinking about microcanonical ensembles of fairly small width. Um, oh, my, sorry, that should, H should be in the subscript. Uh, it's supposed to be a width of width yeah, Hawking temperature or less. Think Hawking temperature over 100 if you want to have a definite number in mind. OK. So uh, I now make an assumption, which is a standard as story in ADS-CFT. There's lots of ways to justify it, but I don't have a rigorous theorem, so I'm going to call it an assumption. Uh, I'll assume that this ensemble of bulk states is dominated by things that are very, very close to equilibrium black holes. That's, of course, as Tom was indicating, a standard part of the ADS-CFT story, that the generic microstate of some finite energy should be dual, should be dual to something very close to an equilibrium state in the bulk. And you can justify that uh, at reasonable energies by doing bulk entropy calculations, just because there aren't enough non-black hole states in the bulk to account for all the states in the CFT. OK. So now. Uh, this Gary is where I'm going to make an approximation. Okay, I'm going to work in the bulk, semi-classical, and weakly coupled limit um, around equilibrium, basically ADS Schwarzschild black holes, which I have assumed dominate this ensemble. Yes. Here, I'll help. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, only use those. No, I think the answer is if I find an observable that maps the energy band to itself, then I can, uh, let's see. 
let me put it this way. I'm argue, I want, wish to argue in a moment that the observables that are well defined in HE to, to itself are those that uh, I wish to use effective field theory to diagnose whether a given observable has that property or not. Whether it maps HE into itself. Yes. That's correct. How do I know that effective field theory has something to do with ADS Schwarzschild? Uh, I, I, I Wait till I talk about mapping HE to itself. Let, this, is, this is a vague introductory comment. Give me a moment and we will discuss this further, OK? All right, I hope my comments will clarify your question, but if not, we will get back to it. Great, what I really want to say, let's not worry about HE yet. OK, let's just talk about what happens in effective field theory around the ads Schwarzschild background, OK? If I study, if I choose to study effective field theory around the ads Schwarzschild background, then we know that you can take a local operator localized anywhere outside the black hole and express it in terms of boundary operators. Uh, in particular, you could use the lovely uh, space-like Green's function construction of Hamilton, Lifshitz, Lowe, and, and Kabat. Um, as a result, in effective field theory, you can translate local operators to these boundary operators and thus to CFT operators. So if I can use effective field theory, these operators are certainly operators that act on what I'm calling the collapse Hilbert space, the space of all states formed by collapse. The interesting question is the one that Herman raised, which is whether or not this operator maps my narrow band of energies into itself. Okay? At least effective field theory would argue that it should do so if I happen to choose an operator whose commutator with the Hamiltonian is small. If the commutator of my operator with the Hamiltonian was exactly zero, it would be clear that it preserves energy subspaces. Okay. So I wish to address this issue. What's not clear? I haven't told you which operator I want to consider yet. You're, you're quite correct that the generic operator of this kind does not map HE into itself. No, I have not. Now, I'm setting the stage. I have said that, uh, oh, sorry, I have, a generic local operator maps the boundary. I've told you that I wish to construct local operators with small commutators with the Hamiltonian, though I have not done so yet. And the idea is that I hope you agree that if I can do so, such operators will map HE into itself. Yes. Yes. It's clear that such things will never map HE into itself. He's not going to use those operators, Eric. Well, let's let us get back to this later. Um, it, I, 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 I don't see how it can not be the relevant question. It's a, as a piece of mathematical physics. If I have an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian, it certainly preserves this ensemble and acts within it. That's just math. Um, now, as I said, my approach here is to uh, use effective field theory around the Schwarzschild background to attempt to diagnose which operators have this property. Okay? That's motivated by the fact that my ensemble and everything nearby is dominated by these ADS black holes, and I want to consider small perturbations of them. If there is some good argument for why this use of effective field theory fails, then that's very interesting, and I want to understand that, and I think that has a lot to do with resolving the issue. Okay. Can I just ask the local operator? Yes? Um, you, you want to have say, definite angular momentum? Uh, I haven't said that yet. Thank you. 
are localized in angle, so at a definite yeah. place on the two sphere, yeah. then the space like Green's function construction uh, fails. No, I, 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 mean, di I disagree with you, but this is a technical discussion we're going to enter now. I think you may be interested in this footnote, which has this asterisk here. Um, let me see if this addresses your question. Yeah, so I'm saying you should work with definite J modes for this to work. If, uh, if you want to work with modes I, I, that I, are localized in theta, then this, this high J divergence you're referring to is going to cause the um, this, this construction not to converge. Oh, I, I agree you want to have things that are smooth. It certainly is difficult to localize things precisely in theta. Yes. No. It's, you don't, there's no, no reason to have... It can't be localized at all. What's that? Let me just mention, state this footnote that I think we can move on. Okay. Um, what is certainly true is if you wish to study high angular momentum modes close to the horizon, it's difficult to do so using this procedure. It just means you have to work hard. The calculations tend to involve large cancellations and so forth. In the strict bulk classical limit, so n equals infinity, nothing stops you from doing that for any j you like. There is no, there is no problem. That's right. But there is something that stops you for doing it from for any you know if you would take some um, function of angle that's zero outside of some range of angles okay so it could be half the sphere yeah there is something that will stop you from doing this from from you know using this procedure to get a formula for uh, mm -hmm. that that might work yeah that's right yeah Okay, so let's just talk about definite J modes, then, and then I would be fine. The, the, it's just that you shouldn't talk about something that's actually localized in any finite range of theta if you want to use this dictionary. Um, I'm happy to take that as, a, uh, as an amendment, although I, I think I have a technical difference with you we could discuss some other time. But yes, I'm happy to restrict to relatively low-lying momentum modes for the moment and mention that there are... Uh, some subtleties with, yeah, actually, no, I guess I don't agree with you. For, for n equals infinity, I can do anything I want. But <laughs> well, I think, I mean, Stefan and Vladimir showed in their recent paper that this, that this just doesn't work for things that are localized in space. Um, but any finite j, I'm fine with. If you so can do it for any finite j, then there's a sense in which you can do it for arbitrary sums of them. No. Yes. <laughs> there is a sense in which you can. You have to worry about orders of limits, and there's some other technicalities. Great. Anyway. Hard, high J is hard. Is it clear that there isn't an, an intrinsic approximation in defining these operators? So, for example, is a single particle operator equal to a single trace operator? Um, up to one over n corrections. Okay, so we, we have a highly excited uh, state in the bulk, mm -hmm. and you are saying that you can distinguish a single trace operator within it. No, normally, we might think that high, highly excited states, uh, it's not so easy to um, distinguish the single trace operators because they're all these trace identities that allow you to, um, to describe the same operator in many different ways. Yes. So, um, so maybe it's not well defined in the way that you want in the full Hilbert space. Well, I, I, so I'm not sure what your issue is, I mean, it doesn't bother me if I have several different representations of what you agree are the same operator in the CFT. Well, it, it, it's not so clear that uh, that there isn't some average we have done in uh, defining this operator itself. So, um, for, for example, the idea is that for any, so you add, for example, a particle on the black hole background. We are adding mm -hmm. uh, um, where we're identifying a particular mode, and mm -hmm. we're saying it is there or it is not there, right? So we're saying that for the whole Hilbert space, um, we can distinguish the operators that contain a particular uh, single trace operator versus the ones that do not contain it. I would say we, we have, um, I'm not sure I would use that language. We have um, a set of let me get to the next slide before I say this. <laughs> sorry, I'm really sorry to slow you down, but I have a okay. question about this, which is, yes? as I understand it, this part of the dictionary does not cover many kinds of bulk excitations that, that also exist, things like um, space, yeah, fill space filling guy. brains, wound strings, et cetera, are not covered by this part of, of the dictionary. Just as True. 
Okay. I will focus on this part of the dictionary. Very good. All right. So um, I want to claim that I can use, that if I wish to study these particular bulk operators, that I could use effective field theory to analyze the question about whether their action is well defined on this particular subspace of finite energy states. And the operators I want to consider, as Juan was alluding to, are to choose to work in the large end approximation. So I imagine I can treat the bulk as some linearized theory. And then to choose some particular mode of some linearized field, which I'll call B. Um, I'm going to choose a mode for later purposes, which is something which is a good approximation to a, a mode of definite Schwarzschild frequency, definite killing frequency. Okay. And the operators I'm interested in are, roughly speaking, the creation, annihilation, and number operators associated with that mode. So the argument goes that if I can use effective field theory to map those bulk concepts to the CFT, then I see that because I've chosen my mode to be a good approximation to a mode of definite killing frequency, it follows the number operator in fact has a very small commutator with the Hamiltonian. Now, it may not be zero. Uh, I'm working in the large n limit. There are 1 over n corrections and so forth. And if I really tried to use an, an, eigenst an exact Schwarzschild frequency eigenstate, that mode would oscillate an infinite number of times near the horizon and be non-smooth, and there'd be back reaction issues. But you can, you, uh, so what I have in mind doing is smoothing that mode out a bit near the horizon. Okay? So that it has some finite commutator with H, but which one which is small. And then arguing that I can make the uh, commutator small enough that as long as the width of my energy range is not too incredibly tiny, um, I should be able to diagonalize this number operator inside the Hilbert space HB. In other words, that, that this restricted energy range Hilbert space HE admits a basis in which this number operator is diagonal, or approximately so. Uh, you could ask, how wide do I have to make that? It's a natural question. And um, I believe the answer is that this issue about avoiding back reaction by smoothing out the mode function near the horizon allows you to make the width of the energy interval logarithmically small, okay. as measured in terms of basically a parameter which controls how close to the horizon you want to probe, which is going to become the temperature of the purported firewall in a little bit. OK. So that's the idea. You choose things which well approximate these uh, Schwarzschild frequency eigen eigenstates. And as long as you have a good approximation, the commutator with h should be small. So you can diagonalize this ensemble in this basis. OK. And now. Juan wished to ask a question about this and whether or not we can uh, do something. Would you like to rephrase your question at this point? Yeah. So the the que so you, I think you are going to be, to assume that this uh, operator N B yes uh, is completely fixed and stays fixed for all the macro state as you vary over all the macro states of the theory. All the ones within my ensemble. Yes. 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 That's right. So that's uh, that's what uh, I'm question. I was and, questioning. Okay. And, and so. So for example, let's uh, as a model. So I, I don't know yes. exactly how well yes. this will work or not, but yes. imagine we consider uh, trace of x, uh, two different powers of trace of x where x is n by Very a matrix. Um, the question is, and we consider those states. Uh, so can we uh, distinguish operators that contain the operator trace x square and write the full Hilbert space as uh, operators which contain trace square and operators which don't. But maybe I should think about it. I'll think about it. Yeah, more. I think that this is not quite what we're doing, but it sounds like a Well, I, I think it is basically what you're doing. So because you are saying that this mode is or is not present in the boundary. And if the dictionary is more complicated and or What we're saying is that, uh, in B, is that effective field theory maps NB onto, let me call it, boundary limits of bulk operators in a certain way. And that if I apply the usual ADS CFT dictionary, it would then express NB as a certain, I guess it's a double trace operator because it's a number operator. And then the question is, uh, is it legitimate to conclude, based on the use of effective field theory in the bulk, that that particular double trace operator 
has a small commutator with the Hamiltonian. And can we then imagine diagonalizing my ensemble using eigenstates of that particular operator, whatever it may be? That's the way I would phrase the question. Yes, please. Why do you say asymptotic? Uh, because, uh, oh, we need a microphone for Herman. So, uh, so these modes B, the fact that you, OK, maybe your input at this point, maybe this is Gary's question. Are you assuming effective field theory here, or uh, are you doing an argument here that's um, independent of effective field theory uh, and, and sort of applies within the CFT language? The argument certainly uses effective field theory because the goal was to uh, study a bulk concept and use effective field theory to translate it into a CFT concept. Once it becomes a CFT concept, I can give a you know CFT argument from there, but effective field theory plays an important role both in the later part that I'll get to in a moment, of course, of explaining the implications, and also in the claim that the CFT operator I have constructed commutes with the Hamiltonian to a, a good approximation. Okay, but uh, but the idea is that these these modes B are defined locally in far away in the bulk, and you're not uh, defining them by means of their wave functions close to the boundary. That's right. They're defined, if you like, near the horizon of the black hole. And we use effective field theory to then translate that to the boundary. You can keep the microphone. All right. So at this point, I think everyone knows where the argument goes. Um, what we do is to say, all right, we chose a particular Schwarzschild eigenfrequency mode to study. But um, let's now consider a different mode, which you would use to describe something like, don't raise your hand. just. Oh, you want a microphone? <laughs> well, I, sorry, I wanted to ask a question before you start. Before I start that, OK. So when you say that the commutator is small, yes. uh, that, it's, it's a very delicate statement to say that an operator is small. Um, so you know, for example, you could imagine a situation where you, know, you have some state, and then for, you know, if you act on that state with a few single trace operators, you know, look at expectation values of a few single trace operators in that state, uh, that, they, that they behave as if they commute. Um, but here you're going to essentially want to say that they commute acting on the entire microcanonical ensemble, you know, which is a huge um, Hilbert space. Yeah, so this is sort of related to, to, to Juan's question a little bit. So, I mean, it seems like, w you know, there's some, there's some confusion here about you want to distinguish the operation of, you know, act, you know fiddling around with these number operators, yeah. which you think of as an effective field theory on top of a single microstate from the operation of just changing from one kind of microstate to another kind of microstate. Um, so, so and and that, that there's some assumption there that I can't process and say when you say that this commutator is small. Where, I mean, it seems let, me, let me help you process that, OK? Um, if I study the effective field theory, and let's for the moment make it free field theory to make it you know, concrete, then I could talk about what these number eigenstates look like. And for a given choice of mode function, I could compute you know, their um, what do you call it? Their wave function in terms of energy. Okay, and you know it has some width. Okay, and then it decays as it goes off to large energy. All right, um, that width of that wave function in energy space is controlled by basically the number of cycles that you trace in the exact Schwarzschild frequency eigenstate. All right. So what's true in effective field theory is that except for exponentially small tails. Um, these number eigenstates have, are supported in some range of energies. OK? All right. So I guess the open question is, can I use that effective field theory calculation to conclude that, to some good approximation, the same thing is true for my CFT operators? Yeah. OK? I leave that as an open question that we can discuss later. But you know, that's the argument. In the, in, the, in, the, in the bulk, it's clear you're working in some range of energies that is small. And then the argument is that because we're studying uh, an ensemble that's dominated by these large black holes with uh, 
small fluctuations, we should be able to use effective field theory to trace that to the boundary. So for example, this, for, for example, this small range of energies includes uh, situations where the black hole is not present and there is some brain that is collapsed into a black hole. For sure, time. absolutely. But with small likelihood. Right. So, yep. so, but, um, and let's say the brain is uh, completely out of the black hole. Uh, am I still able to define that MB for that state? I wouldn't know how to, and I wouldn't. Yeah. I'm not trying to try. It's not, it's not defined for all states. That's. Uh, there's some matter of language here. Um, I think I would say that I wish to use the effective field theory construction. Okay, to define a CFT operator that I will apply to all states, even those that don't have, that are not just simple black holes. And the hope is, or the expectation is, that since those states that you mentioned are a tiny fraction of the ensemble, they can't contribute anything important as long as I put my mathematical physics hat back on and work only with bounded operators and you know that kind of thing, which, I, which we can do if we want to put more details in. All right. Very good. So the idea is that to consider what the implications are in a state of definite uh, B occupation number for a different mode of the linearized theory. And of course, you folks all know how this is going to go. Um, I choose a particular mode that if I was describing what you might call a freely falling test observer, one that just for the moment I assume has no back reaction on the space time, would correspond to the number of particles that the, uh, would correspond to particles measured by that test observer. And of course, I find that uh, the only way you can get an infalling vacuum where the number operator for this A mode is zero is if our B mode state is some highly entangled state with something behind the horizon. Um, as a result, it follows that if I consider P, the projection operator onto those states where the A number operator is positive and not zero, i.e. onto everything except the A vacuum, then the expectation value for P, this is the effective field theory calculation, is some order of one number uh, in every NB eigenstate. And in fact, because the uh, A vacuum is a thermal state in terms of NB, mostly, um, this order one number is, let's see if I get this right, P is the projection onto things that are not the A vacuum. You are most likely to get the A vacuum if you're also in the B vacuum, because the probabilities are thermal. So if you start off with B excitations, it's even worse. So this order one number is bounded below by the overlap of the A and B vacuum. It's a definite number there that, that's a lower bound on the expectation value of P in any in B eigenstate. So we can then trivially arrive at a lower bound for the expectation value of P in our entire ensemble, ta-da. And P, of course, is just a projection operator. Its eigenvalues are 0 and 1. So it follows that there is, there, there is the fraction of states in our ensemble, which are not A vacua, is at least some order 1 fraction. That's the math. All right, yes. Here we're making the approximation that the, the NB eigenstates are the energy eigenstates, right? So that we only have to talk about diagonal terms when you do that uh, trace or whatever it is you're doing there. Yeah, there are various ways to do this. You can make that approximation, or you could say that, all right, what I actually want to do is enlarge my ensemble slightly to be the sort of smallest ensemble that contains HE in which there is a complete basis of diagonal NB eigenstates. And as long as you've only enlarged the ensemble by a factor of, let's say, 1.1, and this number is a half or so, you haven't included enough states to make up for that error. So that's a, a fine way to proceed. How do you know if you can Well, the claim is that we can diagnose how much we have to enlarge HE by looking at the commutator of NB and H, or more precisely, looking at the energy wave function of the B modes. Okay? I've argued that I can make that energy wave function as tight as I want, okay? uh, at least in the, in the L Planck goes to zero limit. And so I can certainly make it very, very small. Um, and as a result, I'm allowed to uh, make the, well, 
That means I only have to raise the upper limit on the energy a little bit. But the density of states is finite. And I have been implicitly assuming given by the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. So as long as I'm going up a small fraction of a Hawking temperature in energy, I've only added a relatively small number of states. To be precise, if I, went, if I raise the energy cap by the Hawking temperature, then that adds basically one bit of entropy, or roughly speaking, doubles the number of states, multiplies it by E or something like that. So if I go up only a hundredth of the Hawking temperature, then I'm only increasing the number of states by a factor of 1.01. Okay, so all I have to do is choose the mode to trace a Schwarzschild, uh, a, a killing frequency eigenstate to a high enough approximation that I only have to raise my energy cap by a factor of 1%, and I'm all set. I have a very tiny enlargement of my Hilbert space, and this argument tells me that the generic state actually in HE contains quantum. Steve has a question. He needs a microphone. <laughs> so a possibly related question, and it's also related to the question of whether, in some sense, you're using a bad basis here. Uh, you know, certainly there are a lot of states that ontotically have, say, you know, whatever energy excitation you want above your black hole state, uh, but that are regular in this A basis. So, for example, you know, if you have, want something with a definite frequency at infinity, you can have an observer falling into the black hole, emit something when they get kind of near the black hole, not you know, right near the horizon, yeah. that has that frequency. And that's perfectly regular in this A sense. In effective field theory, there and, are certainly a large number of such states, yes. Yeah, so, so the question is, can you build up, uh, well, is that a better basis to work in, that kind of state? And do you see the problem if you work in that kind of basis for the states? Uh, I'm not sure if you see the problem if you try to write things that way. As I said at the beginning, what I'm trying to show you is that there is a problem with the assumption that effective field theory works in all the contexts where you would expect it to work, or at least where we would expect it to work near black holes. All right? This is a way of diagnosing the problem. And um, uh, what it says is that there's a problem. In some sense, this, you know, these B states are, yes. they are a little bit pathological. If you think about whoa, 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 whoa. What, what, space, what's wrong with What's wrong with my B let's, states? Let's think about just Minkowski space. In Minkowski space is a lovely. And, and we know that the states uh, that are analogous to this, to the B states yes. there, are uh, pathological. You trace them back, and they have very high energies near the horizon. But certainly, there is a basis of states that are uh, perfectly sensible that we could work in terms of. The, normal excitations above the Minkowski vacuum. Uh, well, and, and if you work with those, you don't get. Uh, so, so let me comment here about what would happen if you tried to apply this argument to just linearized field theory. Okay? Uh, if you tried to apply this to linearized field theory of Minkowski space, you'd have this issue that the density of states is infinite. And this calculation would be sort of meaningless. With an infinite ensemble, who knows? I, what, what I want to do is Probably course, claim that, claim that uh, the typical state in this ensemble has excitations of the uh, A modes. If you have an infinite ensemble, who knows what typical means? It's up to you to define what that means by introducing some normalizable sub-ensemble. And so, you know, in effective field theory, there are certainly two ways of studying the problem. You can try to organize things in terms of the B modes, which might implicitly define some notion of typicality. You might organize things in terms of the A modes, which implicitly defines a different notion of typicality. Okay? Fine. The observation is that is in this not? context, sorry, Don. Let me finish my sentence. Yeah, sorry. In this context, where the density of states is finite, I can give you a notion of typicality which I defined at the beginning before I mentioned A or B modes. What I said is, let me consider the microcanonical ensemble from the CFT point of view, states in definite energy range. It turns out that to analyze that ensemble, the B modes are have the convenient property that at least assuming this effective field theory argument holds, the ensemble can, in fact, be diagonalized in terms of the B modes. And I can do a calculation. It's not at all obvious the same thing should be true for the A modes. So this is actually the, the, the point. The finite density of states allows you to phrase something which becomes a well-defined problem. OK, 
Okay, Raphael wanted to make a comment, so let me uh, back up to him. I know we're done. Okay. <laughs> I mean, when you say Minkowski space has an infinite density of, density states? of states, are you talking about the infinite area of the Rindler horizon? I could, I, well, my comment could be taken at two levels. Yeah. Well, I was actually talking at the effective field theory level. And I mean, if you just do effective field theory and don't suppose some stringy completion, et cetera, then there are two divergences. There's the infinite area divergence and also the IR divergence near the horizon. But it is also true, and it's an important point, that if you think about Minkowski space beyond effective field theory in some complete string theory or quantum gravity theory, which still implements a Bekenstein-Hawking type dens density of states, then indeed, the, because there is an infinite area, there is uh, now again an infinite density of states. But you could just compactify that to a torus for the two transverse directions and get rid of that infinity. Well, you can. You know, once you're down to gravity in effectively two dimensions, the horizon is kind of unstable. The tori, like, you have to worry about stabilizing the moduli. It's another complicated story. Can I just clarify, this A mode is something that uh, is localized outside the horizon? No. The way you defined it? No. It, Absolutely it, not. In it order goes behind the, the horizon as well. I'd call it straddling the horizon, yes. Okay, and it's important that it has a CFT. Uh, I mean, you can't use this. No, nope. I just said nothing about the CFT for A. Okay. All right. And then um, I'm still concerned about these off. I mean, d doing that average of P in the microcanonical ensemble, now you're changing basis to, to the B basis which is approximately the same thing, but there's off-diagonal, you know, there are off-diagonal elements there. And if oh, the, P has many off-diagonal elements in this basis, absolutely. Well, what I mean is the, you know, the microcanonical trace, is, it's diagonal in the energy basis, but it's not quite diagonal in the NB basis. That's right. And there's, there's more off-diagonal than diagonal elements. So I think there's a need for a quantitative estimate of how small no, those no, off-diagonal elements are. As I said, if you just are. view this as enlarging the, the Hilbert space HE slightly to some other space that can be diagonalized, then you just count the, the ratio of the numbers of states and you see how big the effect is. What? So, so I mean, just to clarify one, one thing you just said. Yes. So I think this argument is supposed to say that NA is not an operator that acts on the microstates that describe the black hole. Right? I understand that correctly? Let me say what NA was. Can, can, cannot be an operator that has expectation value zero on most states, uh, and, and it's well defined as a fixed operator in the Hilbert space of, uh, that is describing the black hole microstates. Uh, it, it certainly says that. Um, it says that if effective field theory outside the black hole is accurate, um, then this NA, as defined, let's see, using effective field theory sort of across the horizon, um, cannot be an operator that has the property that uh, this microcanonical ensemble of states made by collapse in the ADS bulk has zero expectation value in typical states. Okay. Now, now one, one just staying with this. Uh Idea. So th there are some there are some states that are look very different from the black hole in this ensemble. Yes, there are some. Yeah. Now, this operator is obviously positive as we want to define it in the uh, for states that look like the black hole, but for other states it might be negative. P. A N A. So let's say N A for one. There is one state in the ensemble where N A has expectation value, or it has eigenvalue e to the minus s. Well, I'm not sure what Sorry, not e to the minus, minus e to the s. N A was defined as a positive definite operator using effective field theory. Right, but, but there, are, there, there are states in this ensemble which, for which this effective field theory, as you define doesn't it, apply. just doesn't apply. Let's say right. a brain that comes out of the black hole. Yeah, okay. So, so, I, I, so if we, presumably I should be able to choose what operator I want to, how I want to extend my operator to such states. Are they, are they orthogonal to the states where NA has been defined? Well, I, I, want, I want to define NA in such a way that it's expected, its eigenvalue for such state is minus e to the s. I won't, I won't object to that. Then, then the expectation value of P would be. Yeah, then, then you make a, t then if, even if, I just allow you to add minus e to the s for the expectation value of, let's say, p in every state, then th that would change uh, the sorry, top I, by I one. Sorry, I missed it. Yeah, sorry. You're right. Tiny change. Steve. Again, related to my question, I, 
you know there are a huge number of states where the expectation value of n a is zero and those states are easily found by working in the a basis perfectly consistent with this story fine so in and if you try to write that in the b basis you see that that zero happens through cancellations involving off diagonal elements etc so that illustrates one of the important differences between the bases and again i think it's a question of whether you're somehow working in a funny basis and making this argument so you know for the purpose of this discussion i'll just say that i've been trying to use effective field theory effective field theory is a concept that once you have effective field theory you can work in any basis you want the answer is a basis independent okay it is you know we can discuss later whether there's a reasonable possibility that the violation of effective field theory from my perspective needed to restore nice behavior is something basis dependent whether that's reasonable Yes. Wonderful. Uh, I suspect that, well, I think we're doing quite well. Uh, I, I, as you said, the goal was to limit to about eight slides for the presentation. I suspect this is either number seven or eight. So <laughs> I will take this opportunity to advance the slide. Oh, this is actually, <laughs> this is actually number six, but seven is kind of trivial. Um, I, I did one mode. Of course, the, action, the real issue comes if you consider more than one mode, several modes at once. Again, in effective field theory, all the modes are independent. So whereas I had some order one fraction of states populated with a given mode A, let's call it a half for, for definiteness, if I consider 100, then I have you know, 1 over 2 to the 100. Only, only, I, if I consider 100, 100 modes, then I only find 1 over 2 to the 100, a fraction of states of size 2 to the minus 100, which are vacuum infollow. And of course, the issue is that this is a particularly large effect when you trace things back near the horizon. You have large blue shifts, and it leads to a, a breakdown of effective field theory, which I had previously assumed. So it argues that effective field theory is inconsistent. And if you treat this naively, you see these large effects near the horizon, you could call it a firewall. Anyway, this story is the problem. Great. Um, one more thing that I wanted to say. Uh, Sorry, can I? <laughs> I'm still confused. That trace, you want to compute that trace in the bulk? Or you want to compute it? I thought you were going to do it in the CFT, so you would no, not I have, have No, I have computed the trace in the bulk. Using effective field theory in the bulk? Using, yes. OK. And then you think there's no divergences because you've defined NB to be like away from the horizon and so on. Is it? NB is, well, the B mode is smooth at the horizon. I have a finite density of straights by construction because the states were defined in comparison with the CFT or selected by comparison with the I CFT. So, that, so the CFT is doing something magical to, to make The CFT it, is yeah. really just guaranteeing that I can talk about a finite density of states for black holes that form by collapse. That's its role. And that's what I think the problem is. All right. Uh, microphone for Herman. Um, I just want to uh, briefly ask if you would agree with this. Uh, so since you had this very narrow energy band, and in yes. order to get yourself into trouble, you had to sort of find you yourself in that band. Yes. Um, at the same time, the firewall problem uh, is seems like a UV problem, at least for the local observer. We would call it UV. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it fair to say that you're basically um, using the red shift or the blue shift uh, back and forth to enhance uh, an argument that's very narrowly tuned in energy to something that actually has drastic consequences for yes, a local observer. Yes, absolutely. Blue shift is playing a critical role in that enhancement. Yep. Right. So, but then, then indeed, and and the blue shift, and it seems to be very understandable from the point of view of free field theory in curved space time. Correct. But at the same time, if the space time itself is dynamical. Uh, it involves uh, a large energy transfer between one system and another system. So, uh, but in any case, I just wanted to make sure that, that, that the, this blue shift and red shift is, is, is an essential part Absolutely. of Absolutely. And my intention in keeping those modes smooth at the horizon was to control exactly some of these back reaction or interaction effects. And I believe that it can be done in that way. Okay. Uh, well, more questions is great. This is really all I have to say for this, uh, for this talk, so let's go on here.
Well, I, I'm just uh, having trouble understanding the objection that blue and redshift should bother us here. I mean, we can we can put the oh. cutoff wherever we want. Um, I mean, it, this could be, you know, we can put the cutoff way below the Planck scale, uh, and then the redshifts and blue shifts translate between energies that are all completely harmless, between the Hawking temperature, which is very infrared, and some other mode, which is not quite so infrared. It's very similar to the cosmological constant problem, where we could complain that the main contribution comes from wherever the cutoff is, which we don't understand. But, but it always comes from wherever that we put the cutoff. We can understand better and move the cutoff down. I wasn't, I wasn't making objection. I just wanted Don to say, tell me whether or not he was making use of them. And he admitted that he was making use of the blues and the redshifts. So what's the significance then of that? Let, let's say uh, that, that Don admitted that he's using them. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Samir. OK, so I, I just want to make a more general comment uh, about the beginning of your talk. Hmm? Uh, since part of the goal of the workshop was to say this fuzz or fire, so hmm? I just wanted to ask a little bit about that. So as far as I see it, it's important to separate two questions. And I think you tried to do that in your first slide. So one question is, is there structure at the horizon? Let me just phrase it that way. And the other question would be, if there is structure, whatever you, way you interact with that, can that be given a complementary description? At least let me try to break up the physics in those two ways. Yeah. Uh, I think you already don't agree, but I shall, I'll let you try to answer that. No, in a I, I, don't, yeah. I don't object to that statement. Okay. I thought you sort of said something like that anyway. In I the did say something order. along yeah. those lines. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So just to put in perspective with where, uh, you know, what the first part of it was, to just uh, so that we can connect to what uh, when we come back to this, the fact that there is structure at the horizon is in fact what the first people have been doing all these years. Anyway. Certainly, we had this uh, strong solidity argument to prove there must be structure. And you know you can have a lot of non-locality to bypass it, but otherwise you have to have structure. And then we also made the structure. We showed how in string theory it can come by making examples. So I think what I, uh, so I think uh, I don't think we disagree on that. So that part is fine. Mm -hmm. I think the other issue was whether once you have the structure, when you hit it, can you get a complementary description? And I think uh, I really enjoyed email discussion with you and Joe over the last year about whether that part can be there. And uh, I think the story there is that you defined complementary too precisely. And once you define it in the way that I had done in my earlier paper on fuzzball complementarity, uh, it, it probably does work. At least the, your argument doesn't uh, blow it down. I think this is an appropriate yeah. discussion for your talk later in the That's fine. In but I just want to summarize. In your talk, you sort of mentioned that you are giving an argument for structure at the horizon. And I was just saying that part of the story is not new. That's exactly what the fuzzball people have been doing all these years. And in fact, you know, all the efforts were geared towards arguing by using a strong certainty and so on that there must be structure. And a lot of people, if, if you don't mind saying, including you, gave us lots of grief that there should be something <laughs> at the horizon. But you know, for over 10 years, we've been arguing there has to be non-triviality at the horizon. We went ahead and we found it also. And I think the real new part, which you did, which is very nice, is to argue that you give a, make a, made a crisp argument that it can't be given a complementary description. So I'm just trying to separate what was already known, for which you might have alternative arguments now, from the part which I think, if my understanding is what you did new, which is to argue that it can't have a complementary description. Yes, I think it's very That's different from arguing that there is structure. The fact that there is structure is what the fuzzball people had done many years ago. And other people had argued before. It's an old story. I completely agree. Okay. I completely agree. Absolutely. Oh, yes, yes. I, I, exactly. I That's apologize. What we I, I, I thought it was not necessary to review the history and give along this a reference with this audience. I, yeah, I think you know this, but what I read in the popular press right now doesn't seem to come like that. I'm reading articles in the New York Times which say that now it has been discovered there is structure at the horizon, and I think that's very inappropriate. Well, can, can you explain to me what you just asked? I couldn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what Samir... What Samir just said, as I, uh, what, as I think that I completely agree with him, there are two issues. One is that there is what I'm calling a problem. Okay? Samir wants to call that an argument for structure at the horizon. I'm not sure I want to use quite those words, but there is, there's an argument there is a problem. Okay? Um, I gave you a particular version of the argument here, which I happen to like today. There have been previous versions. In particular, Samir has a nice argument from several years ago using evaporation and so forth to argue that there is a problem. So the idea that there is a problem is not 
new. Okay? The, sep the, the second th point is, you know, how severe is the problem and what can be done to resolve it? So an interesting question is, once there is a problem, is it clear that it impacts, say, the experience of an observer falling across the horizon? So is it a problem that could be cured? What do you mean to say the structure there if it doesn't impact somebody falling through the horizon? What? So, so we, we have to break off here. Uh, sure there's, there's another talk in 15 minutes, the KHPY Blackboard Lunch. There'll be plenty, ah. of, there'll be plenty of opportunities for comment. But we, you know, we, we have, those of us who want to go to that talk, we have 15 minutes to get our food across. What, what, is, what is that talk? It's OK. So the Blackboard Lunches are. We will, uh, this, uh, you know, where one program explains to the other programs to get to see what they're doing. I know the And the title. <laughs> oh, sorry. This today's is talk. Of it, but today's talk is uh, from the black, from from the people who work on real platforms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have our chance to respond next Wednesday. Well, it's basically, what can you learn about black holes from gravitational waves? Very good. Thank you all very much for the discussion. I'm sure there will be more. <laughs>